get rid of emotional clutter. As I mentioned in the introduction to this training, your physical clutter triggers the emotional clutter. Emotional clutter in turn triggers other forms of internal clutter, which pushes you to engage in hoarding behavior or other personal acquisition patterns that lead to physical clutter. This physical clutter then speaks to your internal clutter and the whole process repeats itself again. You end up in a downward spiral. You're sending all the negative signals to yourself and you end up thinking and doing things that drive you further down this hole. While taking care of physical clutter definitely can go a long way in helping you deal with internal issues, you have to take the next step and deal with this internal clutter. Otherwise, regardless of how much stuff you cut out of your life, you will eventually get back to where you began. You have to understand that, by and large, the physical clutter that we assemble or hoard in our lives is simply a stand-in for our emotional issues. As I mentioned in the previous video, we buy stuff not because we need, but because we read all sorts of meanings into it. Let's face it, if you're looking for a car, you can do just as well buying a Kia. It gets you from point A to point B, it keeps you nice and warm and dry when it's raining outside, it has air conditioning, in other words, it takes care of the basics, but people don't buy Kias. Instead, they long for and desire Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Mercedes-Benzes, BMWs, Maseratis. In other words, you're not really buying stuff because of the needs that purchase addresses. Instead, you're buying stuff because of the emotional signals or emotional reality you're reading into that stuff that you are purchasing. Be clear about this because this is the enabler of emotional clutter. As I mentioned above, there is a call and response pattern here. You buy stuff because you're feeling empty inside. You buy stuff to comfort yourself. The more stuff you have, the more you need because you keep feeding that emotional hole which is perpetually hungry. You have to deal with that emotional hole after you've taken care of the physical component of clutter. How do you do this? Well, you have to change your emotionally stressful habits. This is the first step. If you spend a lot of time with social media, you are doing yourself a big disservice. You really are. Why? When people post their updates, they're showing you pictures of their perfect life. Nobody is going to post snapshots of themselves getting into a heated argument with their significant other. Nobody is going to post video footage of them getting fired from their job. Nobody is going to post snapshots of their bills coming due and their bank accounts zero balance. Nobody does that. At least nobody in their right frame of mind. Instead, what you get are snapshots of the parts of their life that are going right. You get a nice picture of a family going out for lunch. Everybody dressed really nice. You get nice, underhanded shots of the new BMW in the driveway. Of course, they're not coming out and slapping you in the face with the BMW logo. They will come up with creative ways to let you know about their new acquisition. Maybe somebody would post, Check out the new bike I got. And they have a really nice, decent-looking bike. And right behind it is a Bentley. You know the drill. You've been around the block. You know how this works. Unfortunately, if you immerse yourself in that kind of stimuli, you are caught in a social signal soup. You're just beating yourself up. You're essentially comparing the reality of your life with the false reality projected by other people. It's a losing game. You might as well box somebody with a hand tied behind your back. I hope you get the analogy. They're in perfect shape because they're showing you the part of their life that is going right. They don't show you the cocaine addiction. They don't show you the infidelity. They don't show you the cancer or HIV. Instead, they show you what's going right. They show you the perfect side of their lives. In fact, a lot of people who do this, do this to reassure themselves. They're not really bragging. They're just telling themselves, somehow, some way, at least something is going right in my life. The problem is, is you're soaking this all up and the message that you're getting is, I'm not getting enough. My life sucks compared to this person. The funny thing about comparison, at least in a social media context, is that regardless of what you have and regardless of how well you have it going, it will never measure up. Seriously. You might have a great job, but somebody who's unemployed might post pictures of him on a bike trail or a tour of Southeast Asia. It's as if this person who you know is unemployed has all the freedom in the world. You have a health plan, you have a retirement plan, and you have a steady paycheck coming in every two weeks. This person doesn't, but at that point in time, you can't help but think about the freedom this person has. Do you see where I'm coming from here? 
Because whenever you compare, you end up on the losing end because you don't focus on the things you have. Instead, your attention goes to what's missing, and it all goes back to the same place. You don't have enough. That's the message you keep drumming into your head when you engage in emotionally stressing habits like social media. Even if you were to delete your Facebook or Twitter accounts, you're still going to run into this if you hang out with people who brag about stuff that's going well in their lives. That's all they talk about. Keep in mind that a lot of people who do this don't really do this to put you down. In fact, a lot of them feel really insecure. They feel very small, powerless, and lacking control. So, what do they do? They play up the things that are working out. Somebody who did not do all that well in school can make a big deal out of their job. Maybe they got the job because they knew somebody. However, they make a big deal out of that because they know, in the back of their head, they're not really qualified. They don't have what it takes. Here you are soaking it all in, and you take whatever they say at face value. What do you think will happen? You end up losing out. You end up coming up short. That's how comparisons work. This is a very toxic environment, and you don't have to be on social media to feel this. You should dial down or eliminate your social media accounts, and you should stop hanging around toxic people. The bottom line. Getting rid of emotional clutter really boils down to watching what you feed your emotions. That's all it boils down to. It's emotional hygiene. You have to understand that everything you pick up has an effect on your emotional state. Unfortunately, a lot of people are very careless regarding what they feed their head. They think they're just checking out what's going on with other people, paying attention to what's going on in their lives and catching up. The problem is, if you have the wrong attitude, you end up putting yourself in a worse spot. It doesn't really matter what kind of advantages you have. It doesn't really matter what you have going for you. If you have the wrong attitude, you will always come out at the losing end of that comparison. I know, this sounds crazy, but even the most powerful and richest people in the world can make themselves feel miserable through comparison. If you don't believe me, imagine Bill Gates, the world's richest man, comparing himself to Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant. Bill Gates thinks to himself, Man, they're such better basketball players than me. I know that sounds ridiculous, but Bill Gates can easily do that. He can focus on part of his life where he doesn't really measure up against these people who play basketball for a living. That's a guaranteed one-way ticket to misery. That's how corrosive comparison is, and unfortunately, people do this all the time. Avoid that comparison mindset. It's okay to hang out with a lot of people, but if your mindset leads you to do this, then you corrode yourself. You position yourself to lose. Watch what you feed your emotions. How? Well, it all boils down to your mindset. When people are saying something to you, you can always read it a neutral way. You can even read it in a positive way. You can put a spin on it that lifts you up, encourages you, or inspires you. Unfortunately, this is easier said than done. Instead, people read this material in the worst way possible. They put the worst reading into it, and they feel worse and worse about themselves. Be mindful of who you surround yourself with, what you focus on, and ultimately how you read that material. The secret to this really all boils down to managing your emotional habits. I can't blame you for having the emotional habits you have. Everybody picks up habits along the way. In fact, a lot of our emotional habits are inherited from our parents. We are, after all, mostly products of our backgrounds. However, if we are unhappy in any way with our lives, it is our responsibility to ourselves to overcome our backgrounds. Just because your past is a certain way doesn't necessarily mean that you have to die with that past. The big project of life is to overcome past programming. Just because you were born poor and struggling doesn't necessarily mean you have to die that way. Just because you came from an abusive background doesn't necessarily mean you have to live out your life a victim. Do you see how this works? This all boils down to watching what you feed your emotions and tying them into the emotional habits you have. You have to overcome those habits. Eventually, you should reach the point where regardless of how negative people are around you, your positive mental habits enable you to neutralize that feedback. Instead of beating yourself up, you might even use this input to push yourself forward and out. To begin the process, you must first zero in on five toxic emotional habits or to work to minimize and then eliminate these from your life. Toxic emotional habit number one, 
constantly comparing yourself to others. I've already referred to this earlier, but it definitely needs more explanation. You have to understand that people naturally compare themselves to others. I would say that this is hardwired into our genes. We're kind of genetically predisposed to doing this. But how come? Well, imagine thousands of years ago, you and your buddy are walking down a trail and one of you sees a bear. You notice that your friend starts limbering up like he's practicing for a sprint. You ask him, are you crazy? You're not going to outrun that bear. You know how fast bears are. Your friend would then tell you, I don't need to be faster than the bear. I just need to be faster than you. This old joke highlights the fact that people are comparative by nature, and this comparative instinct has a distinct genetic advantage. When people stop comparing themselves to others, it's very likely that they're not going to put in enough effort and their genes will die out. It is no surprise that this tendency to compare seems so hard to shake off. Still, we reached an age where a lot of our basic needs are taken care of by technology and modern markets. You don't necessarily have to be faster than your friend to escape being eaten by a bear. Now is the time to get rid of this default tendency to constantly compare yourself to others. You should actively disrupt such thought patterns. For example, if you see somebody you haven't seen in a long while, and you see their clothing and how fit they are, don't automatically think about yourself. Don't think, what a fat slob I've become, or she's so much more beautiful than me. Instead of an inward-directed focus, one of the most powerful ways to disrupt comparative thinking is to be more outward-directed. Be more appreciative and say, wow, you lost a lot of weight, or you look really good, you haven't aged one day. Turn your analysis and your mental focus on the other person. This is one of the best things you can do because not only does it make the other person feel better, and this can go a long way in cementing your relationship, it also redirects your mind from your normal tendency to compare. Direct more of your attention to others. Be more appreciative. Always remember that the world is not about you. It's a huge world out there. There are a lot of very interesting people. There are a lot of great situations out there. Be more outward directed. Learn to share people's emotions. In other words, be more compassionate. When you're able to do this, you're judging yourself less. You're beating yourself up less. Toxic emotional habit number two, drawing emotional rewards from material possessions. When you look at the stuff you have, stop looking at them in emotional terms. When you look at your most prized possession, appreciate them based on their own intrinsic properties. Instead of looking at the logo of the car that sits in your garage and how that logo brings to mind all sorts of elite or status imagery, appreciate your property for what they do and the problems they address. The car in your driveway would still have the same hood on it. It would still have the same brand logo. However, when you change the way you think about your possessions, the focus now is on the property itself, not what the property can do for you. You look at the sleek lines, you look at the amazing engineering, and you're just marveling at how awesome the manufacturers are. You step out of your circle of concern and your need to constantly bolster your self-esteem. Instead, you get drawn into an amazing technical journey involving the kind of engineering needed to get into the product. Do you see how this works? The same applies to watches, any other kind of luxury item. You can look at a Hermes bag instead of fixating on the H logo. Look at the craftsmanship that went into this thing. It's amazing. Imagine the people crafting it. Imagine the kind of planning and painstaking measurement and attention to detail to create that amazing product. When you do this, you focus not only on the product, but also the people behind it. You're making great progress when you start thinking along these lines because you're no longer thinking about yourself. Normally, when people look at status symbols, they look at the item really as a mirror. What they're really conversing with and addressing are the emotional needs. They look at the bag that has a product logo on it and think about how rich they are, how other people would look up to them. How trendy they are because they carry a bag that is desired by other people and on and on it goes. None of this mental discussion really has anything to do with the bag itself. And it has nothing to do with the people behind the bag. It's all about you. And the more you focus on yourself, the more you're stuck on that ego black hole. And it gets worse and worse and worse. Start thinking about material possessions based on their terms, not based on the emotional rewards you get because you own them. This is how you make progress in your journey to owning stuff instead of having stuff own you. 
Toxic emotional habit number three, automatically assuming that a high price tag means high value. A lot of people confuse price with value. You do know how prices are set, right? Prices are set through supply and demand. When there is a limited supply and there is a significant amount of demand, the price goes up. Similarly, even if there's a huge supply, if the demand is big enough or constant enough, the price goes up as well. This also works the other way. If there's a lot more supply than demand, the price goes down. Pretty basic, right? I need you to pay attention to demand. A lot of people have this crazy idea that demand is essentially a product of need. When the price of weed or pasta, for example, goes up and people assume that it's because of need. People just need for pasta, bread, noodles, you name it. What if I told you that demand can also involve perceived demand? In other words, the perception of value by people demanding a particular product because in economics there is such a thing as substitution. You might be thinking that the demand for wheat is fixed, but you have to also keep in mind that people can switch or substitute rice, potatoes, or other forms of starch for wheat. Wheat, after all, is not the only game in town. I bring this to your attention because a large component of demand involves group perception. The more you can convince people that a certain item has value, regardless of how abundant that item is, its price will go up. A classic example of this is the diamond industry. Did you know that diamonds are actually quite common? Well, that's right. This crystallized form of carbon is actually not that rare. However, thanks to the De Beers cartel operating out of South Africa, as well as a long-running, intensive marketing campaign, diamonds have become very expensive. In fact, a lot of guys customarily give their prospective fiancé diamonds. It's kind of a rite of passage when people get engaged. However, despite that volume of demand, the actual supply of diamonds is so vast and so great that the actual pricing of diamonds doesn't make any sense. It shouldn't be as expensive as it is. Do you see how this works? This is due to manufactured demand. Well, what does all this have to do with you? Very simple. Just because something has a high price, doesn't necessarily mean it has value as far as you are concerned. Its high price may be due to some sort of group delusion, like diamond prices. It may be due to some sort of manufacturer exclusivity. How do you think luxury goods get marketed? When you watch a Calvin Klein commercial or view Ralph Lauren print ads, they try to get you to buy into a lifestyle. A lot of these photographs just show really attractive people in exotic locales, and maybe one of those people would be wearing the actual item that's being advertised. However, these compositions are so off-center that you're almost wondering what is being advertised. It's not like the jeans that are being marketed is front and center of the ad. Instead, you see this really attractive model looking to the side like she has a problem, or another guy just looking dreamily off-center to the side of the photo. This is not a mistake. This is not an accident. This is intentional. The real product here is not the jeans. Instead, it's the lifestyle that you're supposed to buy into because it's so awesome. It's so different from your life. Your life is boring. These models' lives, on the other hand, are exotic, and you would buy into that lifestyle when you buy the product. Do you see how it works? In other words, they are appealing to what's missing in your life. Your life involves 9 to 5 routines. You show up to work, you punch the clock, you work your 8 hours, and then you go home. Rinse and repeat. Year after year, decade after decade. Sure, from time to time you go on a vacation and try something new, but that's your life. Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, all these great fashion brands understand this. That's how they market to people. Abercrombie & Fitch turns this into a science. Basically, they don't show you your life. Instead, they show you this alternative life that you can have, and you experience it when you buy their product. This product is the gateway to this lifestyle or experience. I know this sounds pretty weird, and probably you're thinking, would people really fall for this? You only need to look at the billions of dollars being spent every year or lifestyle marketing to get your answer. The answer, of course, is a resounding yes. The worst part to this marketing is that it drives home the point, ad after ad, video after video, and message after message, that your life sucks. It's not complete. It's not good enough. There is something better out there, but you need to buy our product to get there. When you ask people buying Gap jeans or other fashion items like Giorgio Armani accessories, they want to be able to explain this to you, except they will just tell you, well, it fits good, it fits well, it looks good on you. 
That's their conscious answer, but subconsciously, they made the selection because of this lifestyle that's being pushed. Let's put it this way. If we take people's word for it and they actually bought stuff because it fits well, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but there are tons of other clothing lines out there that fit well. What makes this brand any different? What makes it so special? It really all boils down to marketing. This is what you pay for when you spend $300 on a pair of jeans from one brand when you could have bought another brand of jeans for $30. The funny thing about this is people do this with a smile on their face. They think they're locking into a truly awesome brand. However, if you look at the material, the design, and everything else, it's really hard to justify on a purely practical level spending $300 on a pair of jeans when you can buy it for $30 from another brand or a no-name brand. The difference? The lifestyle. I bring this up because this is what inflates perceived value. That value is air, but let's be honest, it's clever. It shows the genius on the side of these big brands, but ultimately, there's not much difference in practical terms between a $300 pair of jeans and a $30 pair. For this to work, they have to trick people into thinking that high price means high value. The more people you successfully program with this mindset, the larger the market gets. Considering that there is a multi-billion dollar luxury goods market stretching across different industry verticals tells you all you need to know about how pervasive this programming is. I wish I could tell you that this only applies to clothing or perfume or cologne. It doesn't. The mobile device you have in your hand is proof positive of this. If you're just looking for features, you probably would be better off with an Android device that costs all of $50. There's really no compelling reason you should spend over $500 on a mobile device that has a nice little logo of an Apple behind it. Do you see how this works? I can't even begin to tell you how many times I come across people who say, well, I spent $600 on this model because it's worth it. It brings so much value to the table. No, it doesn't. I mean, if we're really honest with ourselves here and are willing to let go a lot of the marketing program. Sadly, this leads to emotionally toxic habits. Just because something has a higher price doesn't mean it automatically has a lot of value. You shouldn't beat yourself up over the fact that you cannot fill your life with high price tag items. At the end of the day, they may not have the value that you're looking for. If you really think about it hard enough, the only value any item can bring is the value you read into it. This process again reflects how the market works because pricing mechanisms don't work based on how much labor somebody puts into a product. Karl Marx is absolutely wrong. According to his book, Das Kapital, the real price of any product is the amount of labor that is put in there. Capitalists make money when they sell the products far in excess of the amount of money they paid the worker to create the product. That's how Marx thought. What if I told you that even if you spent 2,000 hours creating a product, but when you put it on a market, nobody wants to buy it? How much is that product worth? That's right, a whole lot of nothing. Pricing is set by demand. This highlights my point. This drives home my point. The price of something or value of something is something that you read into it. It comes from you. You have to break the artificial link between price and value that is set by the other people. Just because something has a high price tag doesn't mean it has a high value. You beat yourself up to buy that thing because you want to be highly valued. Believe it or not, you have your own intrinsic value. Regardless of what you put on, regardless of what you buy, regardless of what you eat, that value remains. Think of yourself like a piece of gold or a $100 bill. If I took a $100 bill in front of you and spit on it, stomp on it with my foot, crumple it, throw it around, drop some slime on it, how much do you think that $100 bill is worth? That's right, it's still $100. Some people will pick it up because they know the value when they see it. The same applies to you. You may be covered in rags. You may look all scuffed up. However, you still have value. Always keep this in mind because the stuff that you have may not have a high price tag. However, this doesn't take away from the fact that you still have value. Now, the secret to all of this is that the only person that unlocks your value is you. If you act like a high-value person, people will respect you. If you respect yourself and treat others with respect, people will respect you. At the end of the day, this really all boils down to your choice and your decisions. Toxic emotional habit number four, focusing on extracting the good things people have going on instead of seeing them as complete people. Do you hang out with people who are emotional energy vampires? These people hang out with you just to soak up your positive vibes. 
They don't contribute anything. They're very depressed. They're very anxious. All they think about are their problems. They still hang around you because they want to feel good. So you talk about what's going on. You talk about things that are going right, and they ride on this positivity. They suck it all up. These people are extracting positive energy from you. They don't really see you as a complete person. Instead, they see you as a host. They are energy leeches. Believe it or not, you probably do this as well at some level or another, or in one form or another. It's very rare that you come across somebody who just likes to hang out with you because of who you are. They don't want anything from you. Instead, they just want to be around you. Some are even gracious enough to want to give to you not because they are expecting something in return, but that's just who they are. They have a lot of abundance in their life, and it flows upward. Unfortunately, most people are not like that. Instead, we hang out with other people to extract things. Now, it would suck to hang out with people who try to extract money from you. You probably know some people like this. However, by and large, it takes another form. These are people who are emotional vampires. I'm sure you have at least one friend who's like this. All he or she talks about is his or her problems. They talk about past relationships. They talk about things that are not going right. Furthermore, other people like to stoke your own insecurities because they're insecure. So, they get you to talk about your own frustrations by talking about theirs. They're not looking for solutions, mind you. These people just want to feel that there are other people as miserable as them in the world. Do you think this is a positive thing? Well, you might want to think twice. Maybe at first it feels good. However, the more you trigger each other's negativity, the more you create a negative emotional soup between you. Instead of your friendship enabling both of you to get out of this emotional hole, you actually end up handing each other shovels. As you dig in alternating terms, you deepen each other's hole. Believe me, I've been in this type of relationship. I've had friends who just talk about stuff that's, by the end of the conversation, I'm either so sad I want to kill myself, or I'm so angry that I want to kill somebody else. This is a form of extraction. It doesn't have to be one person feeling good at the expense of another person. It can be two people making each other miserable by reinforcing each other's negativity. You have to get rid of this, especially toxic emotional habit. Why? The more you extract from somebody else, the less likely you're going to solve your own problems. All you're doing is just consoling yourself with what is fundamentally wrong in your life without really doing it to solve it once and for all. You're definitely not challenging yourself. You're not pushing yourself past your comfort zone. Instead, you're locked deep within your comfort zone and you're just rehashing this negativity or you're extracting some sort of emotional comfort from your friend. However, at the end of the day, you don't lift a finger to fix your problem. You wallow in it. Toxic emotional habit number five, sponging emotionally off people. Have you ever hung out with people who think exactly like you? You may be thinking that this is a good thing. You might be under the impression that this is exactly the kind of friends you need because, hey, who doesn't want to feel appreciated? Who doesn't want to feel like they belong? Unfortunately, that feeling of belonging has limits. There is such a thing as a comfortable prison. When you're hanging out with people who just reinforce your worst preconceptions, you're not doing yourself any favors. You end up talking and preaching to the choir. You motivate them by telling them stuff that they already and they do the same to you, and nobody's any wiser. Nobody progresses. Nobody challenges their biases. Nobody improves their chances of breaking out of this mental prison. You have to understand that mental prisons become more restrictive when people who live in them network with each other. A sense of powerlessness, a sense of constriction, and the other negative dimensions of mental prisons are made worse when we hang out and network with or bond with people who share the same problem. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you don't get any sort of emotional payoff from this. There is some sort of emotional payoff. However, you're paying a high price for it. You're reinforcing each other's biases. You keep rehashing each other's pet peeves. If you don't believe me, pay attention to a friend who you are emotionally sponging off or who's doing this to you. Track the topics you talk about. I'm willing to bet a lot of money that you talk about the same stuff over and over again. In fact, you consciously bring back stuff that you've already talked about because you want to get that emotional rush. This is toxic. You're not challenging each other to get out of the emotional rut. Instead, you're again helping each other dig a deeper hole. Let go of toxic people. 
To some extent, this is actually similar to the five toxic emotional habits I described above. A lot of the people who have these negative emotional habits are the same as the people who I'm going to describe. You just have to mix and match these, but the effects are the same. They lead you to a bad place. They reinforce all your worst emotional habits. If you want to try to make things as simple as possible for yourself, just identify the following five types of toxic people in your life and start distancing yourself from them. This doesn't necessarily mean that you have to cut them off entirely. You don't have to turn your back on them. You just have to give yourself enough distance so their negativity doesn't poison you. A little distance can go a long way. They're still in your life. You still talk to them from time to time, but they're not so close and so dear that they end up dragging you down. At the very least, you're not so connected to them that you are stuck in this downward emotional spiral. Toxic personality type number one, the black hole. This person has deep and profound emotional needs. They're very needy people. You can't tell by their appearance, mind you. Some look very successful. Some are very attractive. However, when they open their mouths to somebody they feel that they can trust, it's all about me, me, me. It's all about how I lost out, what I need, how the world's unfair, and on and on it goes. It's as if any kind of reassurance, any kind of comfort, or any kind of emotional support simply won't measure up. Even if you give and give and give, it's still not enough because that's how needy they are. They are black holes. All they know and all they seem to be capable of is sucking in positive energy. Do yourself a big favor. Stay away from black holes. I'm not saying that you should cut them out, but don't get so near. Why? Well, imagine a spaceship or a planet getting close to a black hole. What do you think happens? Here's a hint. There's a bad ending. Toxic personality type number two, the judge. Do you have a friend or an acquaintance who's constantly putting everybody and anything and any situation into neat, tidy little boxes? This might not seem all that negative at first. However, this habit of theirs can be quite toxic because life is not black and white. When somebody sees you, they say, you're a loser. Or another person says, oh, you're a winner. It's easy to think that when somebody comes up with a negative judgment, that it's unfair. It's tempting to think that when you come across some sort of negative judgment that it is a bad thing compared to when somebody has a great impression of you and says, oh, you're a winner. Well, what if I told you that they are equally toxic? Why? Well, people are people. We change all the time. We have different dimensions. We have different aspects. There are so many sides to us, and to reduce somebody into a one-word description really strips them of their humanity. If you say to a friend of yours that she's ugly or she's stupid, you reduce that person's being to just one attribute. Maybe they're just behaving stupidly that one point in their life. But for the rest of their life, they're acting like a complete and total genius. Now, does it make sense to dismiss this person as an idiot? The same applies to physical appearances or income mobility or the ability to increase one's net worth. Unfortunately, none of this nuance matters to the judge. This person derives a tremendous amount of comfort in making his or her world as black and white as possible. Everything is extreme. Either somebody is a loser or somebody is a winner. There's no in-between. There's no middle. Stay away from these people. Again, you don't necessarily have to stop being friends with them, but achieve some sort of distance because sooner or later, you start adopting that black and white mindset, and this is very corrosive because the world is not black and white. It's not gray either. It has so many colors. It's so rich, so vibrant, and so beautiful. Toxic personality type number three. The Stylish Hoarder The style hoarder is a person who looks at different people's lives and tries to find trends or styles that they can collect. When you talk to this person, they're not really interested in the real you. They couldn't care less about your hopes and dreams, fears, aspirations, insecurities. None of that matters. Instead, they look at what you are doing. They're obsessed with all sorts of trends. These can be technological trends, fashion trends. Regardless, it's stuff that other people are doing. They then use this as some sort of grid when they're judging you, and they say, Ah, this person, does he think this way? Does he share in that trend? Does she have the fashion sense that this is kind of trendy? That's their value to you. You basically vindicate their judgments regarding trends because they're extracting a large sense of their self-worth and ego from that. They feel good about people being able to spot these trends. They feel good about being part of the right crowd or people who think the right ideas. However, they're very shallow. They collect. They grasp. Conversely, the motivation is very shallow. It's really all about making themselves feel good, 
feel substantial, and feel worthy. Unfortunately, this is all surface level. They don't really have the core conviction or the substance of the trends that they are so obsessed about. When you hang out with these people, you become superficial as well. You start slicing and dicing people based on where they are in terms of politics, cultural sensitivity, ideology, personal style. Unfortunately, human beings are greater than the sum of their parts. You can take one person and strip that person to different layers, but guess what? When you put all those layers together, they don't add up to that person. Something's missing. Maybe we can call this the soul. Perhaps we can call this the essence of that person. Regardless, the truth is that you just can't strip people based on these trends and reassemble them into a complete person. You miss the point. You miss the person. That's how these people think. That's how stylish hoarders look at the world. They see it as layer after layer of stuff that they can reconfigure, recombine, and slice and dice, mix and match. If you hang around these people long enough, you become like them. Unfortunately, that kind of thinking falls flat when it comes to reality because people ultimately are not like that. We're worth more than the sum of our parts. We're not just thin, superficial layers. Toxic personality type number four, the troll. Internet trolls are annoying. You probably already know this. However, the problem is they're not always obvious. In fact, one of the most common forms of trolling involves flattery. There are people who think 180 degrees opposite of whatever view or opinion you posted. They couldn't disagree with you more, but you cannot tell based on their response. It seems like they're supporting you. It might even come off like they're egging you on. However, what they're really doing is trolling you because they don't agree. Whatever opinion you shared doesn't line up with what they actually think and believe. Why are they doing this? Well, they're doing it for laughs. They get a sixth sense of satisfaction in being complete and total liars. However, the problem is trolls eventually reprogram themselves. It's not uncommon for a troll to get such a kick getting people to agree with things that they themselves hate because this makes them hate the person or ridicule the person in their minds. Eventually, they get so trapped in their decision that they no longer know what the truth is. The whole point of the game is just to get a rise or a reaction from people. They're not really invested in whether things are right or wrong or whether things are proper or unjust and unfair. Instead, it's just the emotional rush that they're getting. The person is agreeing with me, and he's a complete and total idiot and a bigot. I gotcha. Who do you think pays the bigger price? The person who is at least honest with his or her opinion as unpopular or unpalpable as it may be, or the person who egged him on? Remember, if you engage in this behavior, you're really trading in your soul. And by soul, I'm not talking about some quasi-mystical component of your life. I'm talking about your integrity. You're lying, basically. The worst part to all of this is that the lie eventually seeps in and becomes you. It becomes part of you. You reach a point where you don't even know which side is up. That's how confused trolls are. They become some sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. It all boils down to feeding insecurities because they're very insecure at some level or another. That's why they get a kick out of getting people to say stuff that they hate or say stuff that they deep down inside want to say. Thanks to their behavior, encouragement, and underhanded tactics, they get people to voice out stuff that they wish that they could say or stuff that they hate. Hanging out with these people brings out the worst in you. Moreover, you end up with someone who doesn't really appreciate you for who you are. If you're not careful, you might end up becoming like these people. Their whole existence is a lie. Getting rid of emotional clutter requires in your emotional habits as well as an affirmative decision to stay away from people who tend to reinforce those negative emotional habits. This is not easy. A lot of this stuff may be fairly easy to understand, but it's definitely not easy to do. You have to keep working at it. The good news here is that you don't have to achieve total freedom from these emotional habits and these people overnight. You don't have to do that. You just have to decide to take baby steps and stick with those steps. Allow yourself to be consistent. The good news is if you keep putting in constant effort, eventually you will break free. Again, please note that this does not mean that you have to cut out a lot of people from your life. You just need to put some distance between yourself and them so they do not emotionally corrode and corrupt you. For more free educational content, visit learnforfree.biz. Content produced and distributed by AllSuperInfo.